what's up everybody great to see you back and finally today we are at the end of the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita I am delighted that we have finished the first chapter and I will be going and summarizing the chapter first I will be reading out every verse no, no not the Sanskrit only the translation in English and then wherever required I will just give some explanations whichever now, uh, verse I feel is very much necessary to be explained in detail. And if you have not watched the earlier videos, then please go and watch so many videos which I have made on the Gita. So, the first chapter has 46 verses and it is the introduction. So, today we shall summarize whatever is there in the first chapter. <coughs> and before beginning, as I say, God is there with you all the time, just... No, no, don't look. <laughs> look to him, feel about him and try to see him and you will find him. Alright. So let's begin with the prayers to our preceptors who have bestowed the divine knowledge unto us and helped us to see beyond the material realm. Although we have not started seeing but very soon we will see. Alright. Om Ajnan Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Vay Namaha Alright, so what's the name of the first chapter? The name of the first chapter is Observing the Armies on the Battlefield of Kurukshetra. So what's happening here is Kurukshetra as we know is a very holy place in India and this great war was fought between the Kurus and the Pandavas. The Pandavas were on the side of virtue, were on the side of religion, truth and the Kurus, the Kauravas were on the side of evil, irreligion. They used all devious means to cheat the Pandavas and take the kingdom, usurp their property. They insulted the wife of the Pandavas, Draupadi, publicly and then also at the end, Lord Krishna was the one who had to decide on which side I will be there. And then when Arjuna and Duryodhana went there to ask from Lord Krishna, Arjuna said to Lord Krishna, I don't want your army, I simply want you. And then Duryodhana took Lord Krishna's arm, army, which is known as the Narayani Sena, which was uh, extremely powerful. It was one Akshohini division in total and Akshohini refers to an army division and then the total number of army divisions which were there in the battlefield of Kurukshetra at that time it was 18 Akshohini divisions all total out of that Pandavas had how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 Akshohini divisions and the Kurus they had 11 Akshohini divisions so the army of the Kurus was roughly one and a half times the army of the Pandavas. And on the side of the Kurus were the great generals like Bhishma, undefeatable, unconquerable. And there was Drona, and there was Duryodhan, there was Karna, there was Dushasan, there was Shalya, there was Bhagadatta, there was Bahalika, there was Bhurishrava, there was Somadatta. There was Jaidrat, there was Ashwatthama, there was Kritavarma and then so many powerful invincible warriors, Dushasan, Vikarn and so many other powerful warriors who <coughs> even could not be challenged in battle by the demigods, what to speak of the humans. And among them Bhishma was the commander in chief for the first 10 days. That means he was the one who was making the primary decisions about who will be fighting in which place and what are the strategies that they will be using for the battle. <laughs> and among the side of the Pandavas, they were headed by the most virtuous, the most noble Yudhishthira Maharaj himself. And then his younger brothers, Bhim, Arjun, Nakul and Sahdev, all of these five were greatly virtuous and then there was Drishtadyumna who was the brother of Draupadi then there was Drishtaketu on their side 
and then there were so many other great warriors also drupad was the father of draupadi and then there was the king of virat also on their side then there was bhuminjay the son of the king of virat he was the prince and so many other valiant warriors now satyaki was also there on their side satyaki was a great friend of lord krishna and he was also a disciple of arjuna and who was the most prominent person there on the side of the pandavas yes you are right it is none other than god himself lord krishna was personally there on the side of the pandavas and he was not having a weapon the sudarshan chakra which he usually possesses but he was sitting in the chariot of arjuna no no he was not sitting and drinking coffee there he was riding the chariot he was the sarathi means he was the driver of the chariot and he had the responsibility to take arjuna's chariot to wherever arjuna wanted and then lord krishna also had the responsibility to guide arjuna and give him advice and suggestions timeless priceless suggestions and ultimately we see pandavas emerge victorious although they lost everybody in fact they lost their father in law drupad was killed by dronacharya later on in the war abhimanyu the son of arjuna and subhadra was also killed mercilessly by the kurus and then we see iravan was the son of arjuna and ulupi iravan was also killed and then the five sons of draupadi were also mercilessly butchered by ashwatthama at the end of the war and arjuna's grandson who was in the womb of his uh, daughter in law that means abhimanyu's wife was uttara abhimanyu was arjuna's son and uttara was pregnant that time and there was one person in her womb his name was the great parikshit maharaj who inherited the kingdom from the great yudhishthir maharaj when yudhishthir maharaj left after lord krishna had departed from this world and at the end of the battle ashwatthama tries to inject a brahmastra into the womb of uttara to kill parikshit maharaj but all his efforts go in vain because lord krishna protects the womb of uttara and then lord krishna personally expands as the four-handed vishnu form who has shankha chakra gada padma shankha is the conch chakra is the sudarshan chakra that disc through which he kills off and wipes out the demons from the race and then shankha chakra gada gada is the mace by which he will hit the demons again and padma is lotus so among lord vishnu's four paraphernalia which he has the shankha and the padma are for his devotees his followers for those who admire him and those who love him and the chakra and gada are for the miscreants the demons who do not listen to him who cause terror in the universe so through the conch he shows enlightenment he shows beginning of spiritual knowledge when he blows that conch and with his lotus the padma he shows his blessing all his devotees and all his followers and all those who have given their lives to him and with the gada and the chakra he is going on hitting demons right left whoever is causing terror to the universe and to his esteemed followers so lord krishna personally expands as the 400 vishnu form and he goes and protects parikshit maharaj in the womb of uttara and then parikshit is saved so this is how the kurukshetra war ends and in the beginning the war is about to commence and now arjuna tells to lord krishna that please take my chariot in between all right so better than me speaking is if we go and start so how it happens is dhritarashtra the king the eldest uh, among the princely orders of the kurus i mean in his generation bhishma is the eldest but 
in in the reign of the monarchs he is the one because his brother pandu was ruling but <coughs> pandu departed from this world because he was cursed by kingdom rishi and then he was the representative uh, of pandu as a king and then he wanted his son duryodhana to sit in the throne but he was not eligible because he was not a good person to sit in the throne and therefore pandu's son yudhishthir was the most eligible person out there to sit in the throne but he was denied that by duryodhana so then dhritarashtra is sitting in hastinapur he is blind internally and externally both ways and there is this person sanjay who is his uh, counterpart who is explaining to him the different uh, whereabouts about the kurukshetra battle and what's happening so throughout the bhagavad gita we will keep hearing verses like dhritarashtra uvacha sanjay uvacha uvacha means one who is speaking so whenever you hear a uh, sanjay uvacha it means sanjay is speaking and whenever you hear dhritarashtra uvacha it means dhritarashtra is speaking all right so dhritarashtra is <coughs> sitting in hastinapur in his palace and sanjay is reporting to him about the incidences now how is sanjay able to report sanjay is been blessed by divya drishti which means a divine vision by which he is able to see everything which is happening <coughs> in the battlefield of kurukshetra by the blessings of the great sage vyasdev that's like a divine led tv maybe <laughs> all right so let's start with the first verse dhritarashtra said o sanjay after my sons and the sons of pandu assembled in the place of pilgrimage at kurukshetra desiring to fight what did they do so dhritarashtra is asking my dear sanjay they have gone to this holy place now what are they doing because dhritarashtra is a bit apprehensive because he knows that kurukshetra is a holy place and that holiness of that place will favor the pandava so indirectly he is asking uh, are my sons alive or they are already dead <laughs> then the next verses sanjay said looking okay, after look, looking over the army arranged in the military formation by the sons of pandu king duryodhana went to his teacher and spoke the following words so duryodhana has gone to assess the strength of the both the sides and then he is uh, going and speaking something to his teacher who is his teacher dronacharya yes dronacharya is the teacher of both the kurus and the pandavas also both the parties and then duryodhana says oh my teacher behold the great army of the sons of pandu so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple the son of durpada so now duryodhana is telling to dronacharya that he is actually being sarcastic here he is telling that look at the great army of the sons of pandu <laughs> so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple the son of durpada so this son of durpada was drishtadyumna who was uh supposed to kill dronacharya at the end because that's a long story because drupada and uh, dronacharya were childhood friends in the ashram of the great sage bharadwaj muni bharadwaj muni is father of dronacharya but when they were uh, childhood friends then drupad who was the king of panchal drupad said to dronacharya that my dear friend when we become big <laughs> i will give you half of the kingdom and i you 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 take half i will take half and then later on dronacharya he went and said to him you said you will give me half the kingdom and then dupat said eh in childhood we keep speaking so many things don't take them seriously i am not going to give you anything and then uh, dronacharya wanted to take revenge he sent the gurus the party of duryodhana and dushasana karana and all these people to fight but they were defeated by drupada and then he sent the pandavas headed by yudhishthir arjun nakul sadev and bhima of course and the pandavas captured drupad and they brought him and then dronacharya said okay now i give you half of the kingdom because now your entire kingdom is with me and 
my son Ashwatthama will rule over the other half. But Dronachari was so open-minded. Uh, yeah, so now what happened was Drupad wanted to take revenge because Dronachari had humiliated and insulted him. So he did a fire sacrifice, a yagya, by which he obtained a son whose name was Drishtadyumna. And Drishtadyumna was default. By default, he was ordained to be the killer of Dronacharya. That is what his wish was that give me a son from the fire who will go and kill this sage called Dronacharya. So that's what he desired. And then Drishtadyumna appeared from the fire, sacrificial fire. That is how uh, yagyas were done earlier times. And from that, of course, Draupadi was also born out of that yagya, that fire. But Dronacharya was so open-minded that Dronacharya, uh, Draupad had sent Dhrishtadyumna to Dronacharya. And he said, my dear friend Dronacharya, please uh, give education to Draupad, uh, this uh, Dhrishtadyumna also my son. And Dronacharya, being a greatly elevated personality, he already could foresee that this person is my killer actually. <laughs> He knew that this person was born to kill me. But he was so open-minded that even though he knew that he will be killing him, he still gave him all the knowledge, all the education. That's his magnanimity. That is why he is a great personality. He is very much revered and respected in the entire Vedic scriptures. Dronacharya, the son of the great sage Bharadvaj Muni. So now Duryodhana is telling, so expertly arranged by your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. Why he is telling intelligent disciple, uh, so, sorry, why is he telling expertly arranged? Because Drishtadyumna was appointed to be the commander-in-chief of the Pandavas. That is why he had the prime responsibility of arranging the army of the Pandavas. So he was the Senapati, as you say, commander-in-chief. So that is why Duryodhana is telling, so expertly arranged. That means he is the one who is uh, making the decisions of who will stay where and who will fight where. By your intelligent disciple, the son of Drupada. So he is telling to Dronacharya indirectly. What a fool you are. You have given knowledge to that person who is going to kill you. And look, look at the beauty that he has created. So beautifully he has arranged. So he is being sarcastic here. Duryodhana is the perfect politician. Always using sarcasm to get things done. <laughs> so by this, what he is doing actually, he is trying to incite the anger within Dronacharya. And he wants that Dronacharya forgets about the Pandavas and his friendship with Drupad. And he fights wholeheartedly. Because Dronacharya had a soft corner for the Pandavas. Because they were exceptionally great personalities. And they were very good. And among the Pandavas and among all the students of Dronacharya, among all the disciples, Arjuna was his favorite. So, because Arjuna was an exceptional student, of course, when everybody used to play, then Arjuna used to go to Drona and say, no, 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 I'm not interested in playing. Give me more knowledge. I want more. All right. So, Duryodhana is indirectly telling him that, look at the blunder that you did. So Duryodhana's calculations are very materialistic. So the fourth verse is as follows. Here in this army, many there are many heroic bowmen equal in fighting to Bhima and Arjuna, great fighters like Yuyudhana, Virat and Drupad. So Duryodhana is telling that not only is there Bhima and Arjuna on the side of the Pandavas, there are other warriors like Yuyudhana, Virat, Drupad. So he is indirectly hinting that the army is not the army of the enemy is not weak it's very strong <coughs> he's telling there are also great heroic powerful fighters like drishtaketu chekitana kashiraj purujit kunti bhoj and saibya these are warriors in the side of the pandavas and then there are mighty warriors like yudhamanyu the very powerful uttamajo the son of subhadra and the son, who is the son of subhadra yes it is avimanyu and the sons of Draupadi. Draupadi had five sons. All these warriors are great chariot fighters. These are chariot fighters means Maharathis. Rathi is one who has a chariot. And Maharathi means there are different definitions of the word Maharathi. Some uh, verses say that 
Maharathi is one who can fight with 10,000 warriors. Some say that Maharathi is one who can fight simultaneously 60,000 warriors. So there are different uh, definitions of the word Maharathi. <coughs> Maharathi basically means he's a leader and he has a group of army and followers. Yes, they are like very powerful warriors, invincible warriors. <coughs> But for your information, O best of the Brahmanas, let me tell you about the captains who are especially qualified to lead my force. So now Duryodhana is using very good technique here. He is telling, oh, look how powerful the army is. Now by that, he is trying to inculcate some fear. Not fear exactly. It's like trying to show them that don't be complacent. Look how powerful the army is on the side of the enemies. So that's his trick. But now he is doing, just see how cunning he is. He is telling, but, but for your information, let me tell you about the captains who are especially qualified to lead my military force. So now he is telling, but don't worry sir, we also have big people in our army. Don't worry, chill. <laughs> so he's using this, uh, he's using this tactics. He's saying, oh look how powerful the enemy is now. But he's also concerned. Oh my God, what if these people... Uh, start fearing about the power of the enemy and now he's indirectly shifting he's playing this not dance from here to there here to there here to there he's telling that let me tell you about the captains who are especially qualified to lead my military um, force so now he's going to describe about his own military power there are personalities like you who is you you is donacharya himself <coughs> Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, Ashwatthama, Vikarna and the son of Somadatta called Bhurishrava who are always victorious in battle. So, <coughs> Duryodhana mentions the exceptional heroes in the battle all of whom were ever victorious, all these warriors. Vikarna is the brother of Duryodhana, Ashwatthama is the son of Dronacharya, Somadatta or Bhurishrava is the son of the king of the Bahalikas. Karna is half-brother of Arjuna and he was born to Kunti before a marriage with King Pandu. Kripacharya's twin sister married Dronacharya. Kripacharya was the priest of the royal assembly there. And his sister was married to Dronacharya. His sister's name was Kripi. Alright, then. These are the great personalities present in the side of the Gurus, the villains. <laughs> There are many other heroes who are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. All of them were equipped with different kinds of weapons and all experienced in military science. So, here Duryodhana is indirectly hinting. See what he says. They are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. So, indirectly Duryodhana is... See, it's said that na, Saraswati speaks through people sometimes. So, it's like saying... In the purport, it is said, In other words, it is already concluded that all of them would die in the battlefield of Kurukshetra for joining the party of the sinful Duryodhana. <laughs> in other words, it is already concluded that all of them would die. So, indirectly, Duryodhana is hinting that all of you present here, I'm sorry, you are going to die. <laughs> because you are staying with me. Yes. Because they say, if in a bunch of fruits or if there's a big bag where there are too many apples and one apple is rotten there it will also spoil the other apples so Duryodhana was like that rotten apple so when other apples stayed with him all of them would vanish our strength is immeasurable and we are perfectly protected by the grandfather Bhishma whereas the strength of the Pandavas carefully protected by Bhima is limited so Bhishma is an invincible warrior he is the son of Ganga and Shantanu, he is the eldest in the family. He did not marry and he has the <coughs> he has the boon of Ichan Mityu by his father Shantanu. Ichan Mityu means he can die whenever he wills. Unless he desires death shall not approach him. And he was invincible. Even Parshuram, his guru, the avatar of Vishnu fought with him for 28 days but Parshuram could not defeat him. So he's telling our strength is immeasurable. So he's telling we are so powerful, my God. 
But the strength of the Pandavas carefully protected by Bhima is limited. So there you see his obsession with Bhima. He's always bringing Bhima, 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 Bhima inside because he's so much obsessed. There you see. All of you must now give full support to Grandfather Bhishma. He's telling this to other warriors. As you stand at these respective strategic points of entrance into the phalanx, phalanx of the army. So he is now telling others that please support Bhishma because he was the commander in chief. Your duty is to protect him because till the time Bhishma is there, we cannot be defeated. Then Bhishma, the great valiant grandsire of the Kuru dynasty, the grandfather of the fighters, blew his conch shell very loudly, making a sound like the roar of a lion, giving Duryodhana joy. So basic, basically what's happening here, Bhishma is he's pissed with this tactics which Duryodhana is using here. Bhishma is like, go to hell, do hell with your politics. I don't give a damn to whatever you are speaking. So it sounds a bit disrespectful when Duryodhana is speaking and then in between suddenly you blow the consul. But Bhishma is indirectly hinting that, my dear sir, just stop it. Nothing is going to work. You are going to die and all of us are also going to die. So in the purport it's written, he tried to cheer him by blowing his conch shell very loudly, befitting his position as a lion. Simhana Adam is the word which is used. So indirectly Bhishma is like, why are you doing all these cheap techniques of describing the enemy and describing our side? It's not going to work. You are going to die. So just shut your mouth and let's start the battle. <laughs> but as soon as Duryodhana heard that, he became jubilant because... He was very happy that Bhishma is now ready to fight. After that, the conchals, drums, buggles, trumpets and horns were suddenly sounded and the combined sound was tumultuous. On the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna stationed on a great chariot drawn by the white horses sounded their transcendental conchals. So now everybody is blowing their conchals. That is an indication of that the war is going to start now. Lord Krishna blew his conch shell, the Panchajanya, Arjuna blew his conch shell, the Devdatta, Bhima, the voracious eater and performer of Herculean tasks, blew his terrific conch shell, the Pondra. Okay, so what are the names of the conch shells? Lord Krishna's conch shell is the famous Devdatta conch shell. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Lord Krishna's conch shell is Panchajanya, which he had taken when he had gone to fight with the demon. And Arjuna's conchal is Devdat. And Bhima's conchal is Ponda. King Yudhishthira, the son of Kunti, blew his conchal, Anant Vijay. Anant Vijay is the name of the conchal of Yudhishthira. Nakul Sade blew the Sugosh and Manipushpak. That great archer, the king of Kashi, the, the great fighter, Shikhandi, Drishtadyumna, Virat, and the unconquerable Sattaki. Drupad, the sons of Draupadi, and others, O king such as the mighty arm son of Subhadra, all blew their respective consuls. So these are the armies, uh, warriors on the side of the Pandavas. They started blowing their consuls. The blowing of these different consuls became uproarious, vibrating both the sky and the earth. It shattered the hearts of the sons of Dhritarashtra. So when the Pandavas started blowing their consuls, the enemy, the Kurus, their hearts were shattered. But when the Kurus were blowing the conchals, nothing happened to the Pandavas. So it's written in the purport that the Pandavas, this is due to Pandavas and their confidence in Lord Krishna. One who has taken shelter of the Supreme Lord has nothing to fear, even in the midst of the greatest calamity. So everybody is blowing their conchals, but when the Pandavas were blowing their conchals, the hearts of the Kurus were shattered because they were very much concerned. Oh my God, what's going to happen? Because they knew internally that they are going to be victorious because Lord Krishna is there on that side. At that time, Arjuna, the son of Pandu, seated in the chariot bear, bearing the flag marked with Hanuman, took up his bow and prepared to shoot his arrows. O king, after looking at the sons of Dhritarashtra, dawn in military army, Arjuna then spoke to Lord Krishna these words. So now Arjuna is going to speak something to Lord Krishna. And it's given uh, here that seated in the chariot bearing the flag marked with Hanuman. So Hanuman ji, everybody knows Hanuman ji, right? He was one of the invincible warriors in the epic of Ramayana who had burned the entire golden city of Lanka and he had done so many Herculean tasks. 
So Hanumanji was also there in the chariot of Arjuna. So now Arjuna said, O infallible one, please draw my chariot between the two armies so that I can see those present here who desire to fight and with whom I must contend in this great trial of arms. So now Arjuna is telling, my dear Lord Krishna, I want to see who is there in this battlefield. So take my chariot in between both the armies so that I can see them. Let me see those who have come here to fight, wishing to please the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra. That means he's telling to Krishna, let me see who has come to support Duryodhana, the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra. <laughs> Sanjaya said, O descendant of Bharata, who is this descendant of Bharata? He is Dhritarashtra himself. Thus, Having thus been addressed by Arjuna, Lord Krishna drew, drew up the fine chariot in the midst of the armies of both the parties. So Lord Krishna took the chariot in middle of both the armies. In the presence of Bhishma, Drona and all other chieftains of the world, the Lord said, Just behold, Partha, all the Kurus assembled here. So Partha is referring to son of Pitha. Pritha's, Pritha is another name of uh, Arjuna's mother, Kunti. So Lord Krishna is telling, just look, these are the great personalities who have assembled here. There, Arjuna could see within the midst of the armies of both parties, his fathers, grandfathers, teachers, maternal uncles, brothers, sons, grandsons, friends, and also his fathers in law and well wishers. So he saw all these personalities. When the son of Kunti, Arjuna saw all these different grades of friends and relatives, he became overwhelmed with compassion and spoke thus. Arjuna's compassion is coming out now. Arjuna is telling, My dear Krishna, seeing my friends and relatives present before me in such a fighting spirit, I feel the limbs of my body quivering and my mouth drying up. So he's becoming weak now. That's just started. My whole body is trembling, my hair is standing on end, my bow gandiva is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. So these are four symptoms of weakness. My whole body is trembling, my hair is standing on end, my gandiva is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. Now, I am now unable to stand here any longer. I am forgetting myself and my mind is reeling. I only see causes of misfortune, no Krishna, killer of the Keshi demon. So he is referring to Krishna as Keshava here, which means Lord Krishna is the killer of the Keshi demon. So indirectly he is hinting to Lord Krishna that you may be the killer of the Keshi demon, but I am not interested now in killing all these people. <laughs> so every specific reference to Lord Krishna's personality with a particular name is very significant in every verse of the Gita. Somewhere he will refer to Krishna as Madhusudana. Somewhere he will refer to him as Keshava. I do not see how any good can come from killing my own kingsmen in this battle, nor can I, my dear Krishna, desire any subsequent victory, kingdom or, kingdom or happiness. So Arjuna is telling, I don't know what good will come to me if I kill my family members. Then, O Govinda, of what avail to us are a kingdom, happiness, or even life itself, and all those for whom we may desire, them are now arrayed on this battlefield. O Madhusudana, when teachers, fathers, sons, grands, grandfathers, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, brothers-in-law, and other relatives are ready to give up their lives and properties and are standing before me, why should I wish to kill them? even though they might otherwise kill me. O maintainer of all living entities, Janardana is the title here. I am not prepared to fight with them even in exchange for the three worlds, my God. Let alone this earth, what pleasure will we derive from killing, killing the sons of Dhritarashtra? So Arjuna is telling, I do not want the three worlds, the hell, the uh, not hell, sorry, the lower planetary systems and the earth and the higher planetary systems that refers to the three worlds the total 14 planetary systems and earth is in the bhuloka that's the seventh so arjuna is telling all these people i have assembled here but i do not want to kill them even if i get the three worlds sin will overcome us if we slay such aggressors therefore it is not proper for us to kill the sons of the and 
our friends what should we gain o krishna husband of the goddess of fortune and how could we be happy in killing our own kingsman so here the six aggressors are mentioned one who gives poison one who sets fire to the house one who attacks with deadly weapons one who plunders riches and one who occupies others lands and one who kidnaps a wife so all these six aggressors can be killed and there's no sin when you kill them but arjuna is telling i still don't want to kill them <laughs> and he's telling oh janardhana although these men their hearts overtaken by greed see no fault in killing one's family or quarreling with friends why should we who can see the crime in destroying a family engage in this acts of sin so arjuna is telling they may not be able to see that this is sinful but i can see so why should i kill them why should i behave like them with the destruction of the dynasty the eternal family tradition is vanquished and thus the rest of the family becomes involved in irreligion so when elders of the family are not sustaining then who will be there to guide the juniors of the family right and by that the family tradition will be destroyed when irreligion is prominent in the family o krishna the women of the family become polluted and from the degradation of womanhood o descendant of rishni comes unwanted progeny so here it is said that from the degradation of the family lineage the women become degraded because they can be exploited by unscrupulous people and then there is unwanted progeny who is essentially not interested in spiritual life an increase of unwanted population certainly causes the hellish life for both the family and for those who destroy the family tradition the ancestors of such corrupt families fall down because the performances for offering them food and water are entirely stopped so if nobody is offering oblations to the ancestors then they will not be happy then by the evil deeds of those who destroy the family tradition and thus give rise to unwanted children all kinds of community projects and family welfare activities are devastated so family welfare cannot take place the welfare of the society cannot take place if the traditions are destroyed if traditions are not maintained o krishna maintainer of the people i have heard by disciplic succession that those whose family traditions are destroyed dwell always in hell so he's telling i will go to hell if i kill my family members alas how strange it is that we are preparing to commit greatly sinful acts driven by the desire to enjoy royal happiness we are intent on killing our own kingsmen so he's telling just for sitting in the throne should we kill our family members better for me if the sons of dhritarashtra weapons in hand were to kill me unarmed and unresisting on the battlefield so he's telling better than me killing them is i go and put my weapons down and they come and chop my head off and the last verse is sanjaya said arjuna having thus spoken on the battlefield cast aside his bows and arrows and sat down on the chariot his mind overwhelmed with grief so now arjuna is completely helpless and he is telling that i cannot fight man this is too much <laughs> There you go ends the first chapter and we will start with the second chapter the next time i hope you enjoyed the first chapter and i wish you will continue with rest of the chapters also there are 700 verses and i am very happy to see that so many people are viewing my videos on the gita that's the main intention which i have behind opening this channel All right if you are new to the channel and you have not yet subscribed then please subscribe to it and click the thumbs up and if you are interested in having a personal consultation with me then please mail me in the website below vedic renaissance all right until next time let's start with the second chapter of the gita see you good night bye bye